The following is with the man from Amsterdam, David de Jong, a Dutch investigative journalist who used to work on the billionaire's desk in New York for Bloomberg. His job there was to uncover hidden fortunes and as well explore the power of the huge private wealth of family offices all across the world. It was during this job that he discovered one day uh, a very underscript website which documented an 18 billion euro wealth which was connected to a German family office. David pulled that thread all the way back to the upper echelons of the Nazi party. And this moment then led David down what became a four-year path. He moved to Berlin to embark on this investigation, which led him into the darkest and dustiest vaults of Germany's corporate past. What he uncovered was Nazi wealth that has endured to this day and has its tentacles wrapped around many companies that you and I would consume or interact with every single day, not least of which everyone's favorite pizza, the frozen Dr. Oetker's. In this podcast, David speaks about growing up in Amsterdam, the amazing power of family offices and hidden wealth, the slave labor from Nazi concentration camps, billionaire Nazis, whitewashing of history, and a bit about serendipity as well. Now, before we get to the podcast, be sure to pump your good juice into the algorithm and share this podcast with a friend. Because if you are interested in this, then you'd be keen to check out my financial secrecy starter pack, which is to list all of the episodes of a similar nature to this very one, which you're about to listen to. The link for that is in the description. And don't forget that this podcast took me five hours to put together. And if it only takes you five seconds to review, then I would very much appreciate you doing that for me. Now, without any further ado, here is the great Dutchman, David de Jong. First of all, Mr. De Jong, talk about growing up in Amsterdam. Yeah. I mean, I love it. I'm, I'm there currently. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, uh, it's a great place to grow up um, because you live in a city, but it feels like a village, <laughs> which, you know, as you grow older, it becomes more kind of suffocating and, and, and you want to get out. But as a kid, it's 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 wonderful, um, you know. And I even stuck around to do my bachelor's degree there, so couldn't really phantom myself uh, studying anywhere else. I mean, I had already planned to go abroad after that, so um, so it's nice. And I, I mean, I come back frequently, so it's 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 really you know. I mean, it's changed a lot. It's become far more international um, in the past. 10, 50, yeah, I would say the past decade, the past 10 years. Um, but, and, you know, it's also kind of overrun by tourists now, but but it's a great, I mean, I will always come back there. Mm. It's, you know, uh, I don't think it will, I mean, it will always be a base for me. I'm, I'm not sure if I will, if I will live here again, but, but like permanently, but, you know, I will always come back here. I mean, all my childhood and, 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 and university and, and the friends are here and of course my family is so yeah so it's 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 good always good to be back so you grew up there in the 90s talk a little bit about the change uh, because I remember living there only a few years ago that people would talk about how it was much more dangerous or there was much less tourism I mean yeah sure I mean it was definitely never felt dangerous to me because I think you know, where like the areas where a lot of like junkies were and stuff, you know, I wouldn't really go there as a, as a eight, nine year, 10 year old. So, so it felt, it, it, it felt very safe. Um, but you know, it was a less international city. Um, so there were also less tourists. And I remember that when I started studying 2004, 2005, um, my undergraduate studies at the at university of Amsterdam, you know, all the big museums were closed for massive renovations and it, they, they, that took like a decade or something. So there was also a reason why there were just fewer tourists, mm. uh, you know, or, or perhaps let's put it this way, the, the influx of stack dues and, and hand parties, you know, exploded, whereas the kind of the, those that were looking for, those tourists that were looking for more, uh, yeah, cultural, uh, cultural place to visit, uh, at that point, uh, pretty much dipped, and I think now it's probably on par. But they're you know both numbers are completely out of control. This might seem like a random question, but how do you reflect as a Dutch person, um, yeah. living in a bunch of different cultures now? If you could just yeah. turn the 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 lens on your own culture, what yeah. do you make of Dutch sure. people? 
You know, I... Yeah, the Dutch are a funny bunch. You know, I think they're very... Oh, I mean, they're very... They're very open and, and, and forthright and blunt, you know, and, and kind of all those things. But I think that's all quite surface, you know, because one thing, now that I'm living in Israel at the moment, uh, you know, every, I think particularly my, my, my German fiance, she's, you know, quite, she can't really deal, she finds the aggressiveness of Israelis really hard to deal with. <laughs> but as somebody growing up in the Netherlands, you're like, you know, it's, it's, I don't mind it that much. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, the Israelis are next level, but, but I would say growing up in Amsterdam, it, it's, or growing up in the Netherlands, you can definitely, there's not, I find living in Tel Aviv, uh, not that much. Uh, well, it's very different, but I don't find the kind of the elbowing, uh, that much of a change from, from growing up in Amsterdam. Um, and other than that, you know, I think uh, the Dutch are very open, but I think it's quite a superficial thing always, you know, really getting into kind of so socially, I think for an outsider, it's really hard to get into, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, Dutch culture and there's expat culture in Amsterdam. I think it's, there's, there's very little crossover between the two. And that's something that I struck when I moved to Berlin from New York in 2017 was really how welcoming actually how how germans on the surface are much more reserved but how they're you know once you as soon as you get deeper they're they're far more open in a way far more open to outsiders which you know i think that's one thing about uh, you know germans that people don't wouldn't necessarily uh say or as i said would you know. mm. What about growing up in Amsterdam, the connection to the Nazi history? You know, when did the significance of the gold plates out the front of doors become uh, known to you? Well, that's only something that's quite recent, you know, these kind of, that's only something that they've started doing in the Netherlands uh, in the past recent years where they, where, where you know, they, they t took it after the, of course, it was a German who came up with that. Um um, and they've only started doing that in recent years. But I think what was striking to me growing up in the Netherlands is how little you learn about Dutch, the Dutch, uh, Dutch culture, or like the Dutch attitude during World War II or during 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 German occupation. I would say so. May four, nineteen forty, May nineteen forty five, and um, that really. I think that's something that only in recent years, you know, where the Netherlands relative to population deported the most Jews. Um, well, the Netherlands under German occupation had the most Jews deported relative to population. Um, only behind Poland and Hungary. And there's now actually two weeks ago, this really book, good book came out by the New York Times correspondent in Amsterdam. Her name is Nina Sigal. Definitely somebody you should you should um, you should have on your podcast. And she wrote a book called The Diary Keepers, which looks at seven Dutch people during World War II, uh, three Jews, two people in the resistance, and two um, you know Nazi collaborators. And she was struck as a Jewish woman who'd grown up in Long Island and Manhattan, moving to the Netherlands twenty years ago. Just how, you know, there was all this talk about Jewish culture, for example, but there's no Jews around, right? And 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 she she describes that quite, you know, how how they've kept that so secret, you know. In 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 the Netherlands, if you speak with anybody about their kind of World War Two past, you know, or, or not their World War Two past, but their families, you know, everybody was in the resistance, kind of that. That's kind of the the theme and that's some kind of you grew up with oh we were so great you mm. know but you know nobody talks about the, the widespread collaboration mm. uh, in the netherlands it was very prevalent yeah what about your own uh family connection with the nazis your grandfather served served is the wrong word was uh, captured uh prisoner in yeah. the camps yeah 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 i mean 
I mean, it has nothing to do. I mean, the reason I wrote the book has nothing to do with my family history because I always say, you know, I mean, there's tens of millions of Europeans who have similar, there are European families who have similar stories to mine. You know, my grandfather from from my um, mother's side, you know, he was, you know, was Protestant, very kind of patriotic Dutchman who, who, you know, was 25 when he was a very avid sailor and he tried to sail. Uh, with his best friend to to the UK, uh, to England to join the Royal Air Force, and in, and on the second attempt, they were blown back to shore and they were arrested by German soldiers, and he was he was sentenced as a political prisoner, and you know was forced to work, uh, you know he was a sla- he was a forced labor slave laborer, work in a, in a steel factory in 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 Bochum in in the Ruhr area, for my father's and you know he barely. You know, he was like six foot five and he came out, you know, emaciated, you know, uh, weighing very little and, you know, was recuperated in the sanatorium in Switzerland and they married my grandmother and my mom came, was born not long thereafter um, in the late 1940s and, you know, the eldest of four. And, and from my father's side, um, you know, they were Jewish or my grandparents were Jewish and my grandmother, my grandfather hid in Amsterdam in the center of Amsterdam for three and a half years. And my grandmother fled with my aunt who was then three. Um, she's now 84. Uh, she still lives in Amsterdam. Um, you know, they hid to, to Switzerland because my grandmother, or they fled to Switzerland because my grandmother was um, a Swiss citizen. And, and she was born and, and raised in Zurich. And they, you know, they fled together with a friend of them, Max van Damme, who was a famous painter. And they were caught by the, uh, by the Gestapo at the French-Swiss border. Uh, we're talking 1942. So really the height of, of deportations and, and the height kind of of the, of, of, of the start of, of you know, uh, of, the, of the Shoah. And... Yeah, this Gestapo officer took pity on my grandmother and my because she was, you know, had a three year old with her, and said, "Okay, go back, leave tonight, or like you know, report back tomorrow morning." Um, and they fled that night over the mountains to Switzerland, uh, aided by uh, you know, a shepherd and and the uh, the maid in the hotel. Uh, but you know, Max von Damme, he reported back the next morning, and he was deported and was murdered in Sobibor. So you know, it's kind of goes to show how, yeah, how you know history is. You know, I always think it's kind of a miracle that I'm here from either side. You know, whether Christian, Jewish, you know, it's like yeah, whatever grandparent. You know, I think it's just. But I think again, that's the story of tens of millions of Europeans from, from from this era, you know, alive today. And of course, yeah, so many aren't. There's no need to hide in the masses and say, just because it's a story of 10 million others, doesn't make that own story extremely uh, significant. Oh, no, for me, of course, it's really, it's inc- incredibly significant in the sense that uh, it's the reason I'm alive today. But, yeah. but I do think it's important to put it in a proper historical context. Yeah. Does that ever... Um, sort of influence your decision making or the way you think about the world this sort of never hyper hyper knowledge of what could have been never no no i guess never. not no, what about that's not, um, that's not how I, that's not a way to live your grandfather uh hid in amsterdam for 3 years um what stories did he share with you and his family about that time he already he already he passed away in 1973 so so I never got the chance to know him I mean I was born in the late 1980s so so unfortunately my, my father was quite young when he passed so my father was only 23 so but what I did get to know and this is in a, many ways you know another part of the journey it kind of started around 2009 it's all kind of linked with the book but when I first moved to New York for my masters in in in, in the fall of 2009 uh, was a master's in, in, in history and international relations. And um, my aunt was visiting the aunt, uh, now 84, Jacqueline. She's, a, she's, a, she's, a, she's an artist, she's a painter. And she, was in, and she was in New York because she had an exhibition at a university uh, in Connecticut. 
And she was reading, the, she read the front page of, of the week edition of New York Times. There was an article there about a woman who, 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 together with her mother and grandmother, had saved Jews in in Amsterdam or had hit Jews in Amsterdam dur- you know, during World War II. And then there was a description of a man, and, and my aunt was like, that's your grandfather, you know. Or she she describes your grandfather in in this book and or in this article, and then you know she and then my aunt wrote to this woman called Tina Strobels who had immigrated to the U.S. after World War II and became a child psychiatrist, and you know I got to interview her spring 2010 for a class that I was taking on oral history. We kind of became you know friendly. I went to visit. I celebrate her 90th birthday. Uh, with her and, and she told me all these stories and there was actually a book written about her by a Dutch journalist which came out a couple of years after she passed because she died in I would say also 2012 she died yeah no yeah it was 2012 yeah um, and so she yeah so so she told me all the stories about kind of how they made a party out of it a little bit while in hiding you know, but my grandfather, you know, he would like kind of, yeah, they would, they would have, a, they would have tried to make the best times of it, you know. Mm. So, so yeah, that's, that's so that's kind of how I got that that story, to, these kind of stories to me. And forgive me if I'm belaboring the point, but w- when he's talking about hiding, is he sort of under floorboards? Is he in a secret room, or is he just having adopted another identity but living in plain sight? No, no, you, you, they would stay inside. I'd, they would stay, it, the house, it was kind of this canal house. It wasn't on the canal, but it was very near the canals. Um, and there were all kind of secret compartments mm. and, 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 and hidden attics and et cetera, et cetera. And, and he was, I think, I mean, they could just be in the house during the day, but they could, couldn't really leave. Yeah. I mean, barely, yeah. Well, how did a master's in history and international relations end up teeing you up a job at the billionaire's desk at Bloomberg? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I was, I was, you know, I did my, I did my master's, and it was one year in New York, one year in London, and afterwards I came back to New York because I got a one-year work visa, which every graduate, foreign graduate of a bachelor's and master's program gets in in the U.S. And so I was I was looking for a job in New York in media, and then via via I got introduced to a new team that they were starting at at Bloomberg, which uh, looked at family owned companies and hidden wealth, um, and and yeah, and it, I interviewed with the team, and it was it was a good fit. So and, and I was actually hired as as one of the because I mean one of the blind spots of Bloomberg was to you know they they, they focus on listed on stock exchange listed companies and, mm. and not so much on family owned companies and family offices and it was a huge space there to be covered and so many good stories yeah that that would come out of that and um that's how yeah that's how i really you know uh, and i was interested in doing you know in 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 in, in doing more you know, doing a lot of research, doing more investigative stuff already right from the bat, and and um, and yeah, so it was a, it was kind of natural fit. I mean, I was actually hired as the North America reporter uh, on that team, and then they soon asked me if I could cover the German speaking mm-hmm. countries because I'm Dutch, and they thought you know this Dutchman speaks fluent German, you yeah. know, because it's all one one the same. <laughs> it's all one thing. So. So yeah, and then that's You're how just I came told on, on the topic of the book as well. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> uh, but you were reluctant, weren't you, to leave New York and to to do the German desk? Well, I w- wouldn't leave New York. I didn't oh, have okay. to leave New York. I was. I didn't. You know, I could do it from New York. So that was no, no. I would do it from New York, and I would I would travel to Germany uh for a month a year um, between thanksgiving and christmas i would mm-hmm. i would go and do a reporting trip mm-hmm. in the in the in bloomberg bureaus in in germany um austria and, and switzerland that must have been such an exciting time 
It was, it was, it was a lot of fun. Mm. It was a lot of fun, you know. It was, yeah, it was, it was great. It was exciting. You sure. said um, there were so many good stories in these uh, family offices and more private wealth. Um, yeah, the desk you were covering. Now you obviously yeah. um, tackled the uh, history of these German private, uh, yeah. old family offices and private families. But I wonder you and your colleagues between you, what is another geographical region or a specific part of history or right now somewhere in the world where incredibly interesting stories of family offices and private wealth are playing mm -hmm. out today? Yeah. Um, well, I'm currently a Middle East correspondent and I can tell you in terms of hidden wealth and, and kind of family office space and just, so it's you know, all Dubai. Money, you know, well, not no, but I would say Qatar. It's the Gulf for sure. It's mm. Saudi, Qatar, Emirates, Dubai, Dubai, Abu Dhabi. You know, people always say, but it's Abu Dhabi uh, as well, very much so. Even perhaps even more so than Dubai. Um, and but but you know, I think I, I do think that the Gulf, in in terms of uh, well, it's not so much hidden, but there is a lot hidden there. Uh, because now you know the entire capital markets now you know there's no ipo happening in europe and and and, and the us at the moment i mean well especially see, see what's happened the past couple of days you know credit suisse being being shored up with a 50 billion injection from the swiss national bank today you know bankruptcy or yeah bankruptcy and bailout of silicon valley bank you know um but but in the but but in the in the, in the Gulf, you know, the IPOs are like it's it's there's a there's a total. I mean, they're privatizing the economies, uh, you know, which was state owned, especially if you look at Saudi and and um, uh, and uh, and the Emirates. They're trying to make a shift away from. They want to diversify the economies away from from natural resources, and you know, they just of course had a banner year. With energy prices through the roof, so they've made so much money. I think Saudi Aramco announced on Sunday or last week that they've made a profit of 150 billion uh, over 2022. And yeah, so so I think that is definitely the most exciting space. You know, South America. I would say Southwest Asia also fascinating. Africa. You know. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, my focus at that time was was the U.S. and Western Europe. Um, so yeah, so that that's um, yeah. That, Are you prepared so, to so, tantalize us with a potential scoop that you have in mind? Yeah, I'm definitely not going to say that on a, <laughs> on, a on a podcast. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, uh, back to um, you said yeah. that you were a good fit for Bloomberg. Um, I. I'm under the impression that, you know, it's extremely hard to get that type of job. And at the time, you would have been in your late 20s, mid 20s. Uh, so you must have done something pretty impressive to get on there. D can you, do you know what that was? I mean, I had a good click with my editors who I met, you know, and I think, I mean, you know, I think everybody, um, Everybody else that they interviewed, they said, oh, who do you want to cover? And everybody said, you know, Steve Jobs, who was then still alive. I mean, this was, he was just before he passed. This was like mm. September 2011. Right? Steve Jobs and, and Mark Zuckerberg. And I'm personally not super interested in, in, in Silicon Valley tech and et cetera. So I... So I also, you know, said said more kind of the, the things I wanted to cover were also more like kind of the family office space, uh, privately uh, privately owned, family owned companies, and I think they were struck more with the fact that I really wanted to get into weeds and, of course, focus on families who do not, you know, where there's family businesses where, you know, it's hard to get, you know, revenue figures. It's pretty much impossible to get any kind of. Uh, pro profit figures, EBITDA figures. So I think, yeah, the fact that I really wanted to get in the weeds and, and focus on that rather than, you know, focusing on, on Silicon Valley, which is kind of a, yeah, which at the time was very exciting, but also, yeah, it's kind of, okay, sure. It's kind of uh, a vanilla answer that, yeah, that, that I think that, that, that set me apart. Nice. So maybe, um, 
you could pull off the lid and take us into the world of family offices. How much wealth are we talking about? How significant is the power behind this money? Um, what's something interesting that you learned? Wow. Um, I mean, the 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 the, the, um, the 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 vast wealth of family offices today. I mean, it's been growing incredible. That space been growing incredibly uh, in the past decade. But it's you know, it's an unregulated market. But we're talking about you know trillions trillions of dollars and, and euros of wealth already, wow. and it's. It's a you know it's 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 to have vast it's just it's a it's vast spending power it's 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 uh, you know whether it's in real estate or or private equity funds or private equity deals even um, where family offices team up and and start doing private deals themselves um, rather than through you know your typical private equity companies or team up with private equity companies to take a company private. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's, it's still, it's still a very private space. It's yeah. It's, it's fascinating in the sense that how much private capital can, uh, you know, uh, how much families or even individuals, you know, can wield power. And I think that's also something that's interested me generally in that spare in that uh, on that topic is you know i'm not really i'm I, I don't really like abstract stories about you know companies or banks or or whatever where it's kind of a, these kind of nameless faceless entities you know it's really sure i like focusing on, on the individual and and or on the family uh, where you have characters you know that that that, that drive a narrative forward or you know, people, you know, people, people are such an interesting story, you know, and, and I think, you know, individuals with enormous amounts of, of you know, economic and financial influence, influence, um, you know, whether by birth or by self-made or however, it, 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 that always gives for fascinating stories. Do you have any insight into the Australian ecosystem of all of this um no i don't okay i no, don't no i don't I, I just wanted to put no, it out no, there I, in I, case you no, have no, something no, interesting no, but no, um no, give us an example no. then of wielding power you just said how these private individuals will wield power with their massive fortunes um put a name to it yeah one of the families that i cover you know in the, in, or the main family i cover in the book at least one branch, you know, they control BMW, they control the BMW group, which is not only BMW, but it's also Mini and Rolls Royce. And uh, it's, it's uh, you know, Germany's wealthiest siblings, Susanne Clutton and, and, his, and her, bro her brother, Stefan Quant. And, you know, they own 47% of, of the BMW group, it's listed. And, you know, they got a dividend of, of 1 billion euros and last, just last week, you know, if it's and, you know, it's annual. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, and they invest in many other things as well. And I think it's the sheer economic and financial power invested in one or two individuals that is also, I mean, it's fascinating. It's also kind of scary, you know, it is also, and, and of course it wasn't them, you know, they inherited that stake um, together with their mother at the time. Um, but... Yeah, it is. It is, but it's also really important to hold these kind of people to account. You know, I think that that's more, if it's all, but also to kind of, uh, and and that you know to kind of pivot to the book, my book. Then it's more kind of a historical and 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 moral reckoning that that the focus is off. But 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 um, yeah, it's also kind of. What do you do with the responsibility with the responsibilities that you have of you know of the that you inherit? Mm. I mean, before we do transition to the book, I'd like to hear you just yeah. um, talk a little bit about how this private wealth abuses the offshore and financial secrecy ecosystem. What uh, you uncovered there? I mean, 
it's 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 changed a lot in the past decade you know whereas switzerland has become for example has worked more with with you know with authorities and 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 had gone you know post 2009 kind of this whole ubs american scandal where where um yeah um you ubs re- received a huge fine to uh for um having american clients who you know had billions stashed away and in, in, in tax uh, for tax evasion purposes where you know kind of Liechtenstein is still a total wild west you know it's like don't don't put your money don't 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 put your money there i would i would say it but but all these other you know i mean singapore has become far more regulated but now it's like dubai you know it's like a lot of the gulf a lot of you know if you look see now at russians you know they're all flocking everybody's they're all flocking to dubai um where and not only russians but there's a lot of i mean you know it's also it's become also for you know for the cart for for cartels like italian italian um mafia dutch uh, criminals who were big in the cocaine trade that they set themselves up in dubai now there's actually now you know it's actually they're more at risk because there's actually there's uh, extradition treaties between uh, the emirates and the netherlands for example but um there yeah i i would say in in offshore and it's the us actually i mean it's you have like Nevada, Wyoming, all these strange states that, that, that and of course Delaware is the strong ways. You know, the US is a massive officer center for, for both corporate and individual um um you know uh, offshore purposes or uh, um, tax uh you know uh, fiscally attractive places to to base yourself. And the Netherlands, you know, is still a, a corporate tax haven, you know. I mean massive. I mean it's Nothing has been done to kind of clamp down on that, you know. The Dutch, in a in a in a endless opportunism, you know. That's not something. It, it's and it's also favorable for for expats. You know, there's a thirty percent rule mm. for expats that they only have to pay thirty percent tax, as opposed to fifty four percent or fifty six percent, which is the highest tax bracket. But that's in the on that income. specific. I, I used to actually work with a bunch of guys who were on that specific rule. Um, Right. I don't know if I yeah. class that as mm-hmm. necessarily, you know, exploiting the the ecosystem of offshore finance and financial secrecy. No, I'm speaking specifically no, no, about no, guys who no, right. are reporting their income in countries that they own a piece of property in, but they step foot in once a year, you know, even though they yeah, consume the public element. good of another country. Like real egregious right, stuff. But that's an element, yeah. Right. But that's an element too, you know. I mean, I would say the 30 per day, kind of, it, it's, it's, the Netherlands is still one of the biggest corporate tax havens in the world, both for individuals and for corporations. So, um, so you know, there's all these lawsuits going on, and some have been going on for decades with regard to Russian assets being incorporated in the Netherlands. Mm. You know, Gazprom, um, yeah, and and the likes who have massive entities here. You know, and it's and that's why a lot of uh, you know, Nike has been here for decades. It, it's also just attractive. It's attractive to to base yourself in the Netherlands as a com- as a uh, as a company, as an international company, for that very reason. Well, it's one of the reasons, but it's often the main reason. How do you think of the ethics of tax evasion or um, exploiting existing accounting shell companies, accounting tools that can make you dodge income? Just overall, how do you think about the ethics of it? I mean, the ethics are, are you know, I mean, there's all there's there, there's a very narrow line between you know tax avoidance and 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 tax evasion often, right? I mean, whereas tax avoidance, which is what we're talking about here for the most part, mm. you know, is is just using the existing rules in place in whatever jurisdiction it may be to avoid. Texas in wherever you base yourself um, uh, vis-a-vis tax evasion which you know 
is 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 becoming more and more outdated um um or at least you know i naively seem to get that impression perhaps um you know i mean the ethics even with with text avoidance are, are, are pretty terrible you know i mean there's 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 kind of still entire countries small countries that market themselves solely off of that you know yeah off of that uh, off of the, having that kind of it's their main selling export point of, 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 of yeah exactly yeah 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 play, plenty of pacific plenty of caribbean or pacific islands or, or other special jurisdictions who, who market themselves solely for that purpose mm. so those ethics are pretty terrible i think as a nation state yeah as we transition into the book i'd like you to keep the offshore finance discussion top of mind because it'd be fascinating uh to hear specific things that you discovered in it but to transition sure. you stumbled across this inconspicuous website of a person you just spoke about harold quant and the holdings had 18 billion dollars and he asked how's this obscure german family office with a bare bones one-page website managed to invest such a staggering amount of money so the yeah. book covers five families and yeah. these are just some of the brand names that they're connected to uh household names siemens thyssen krupp who i think are the elevator guys Allianz, the Oetkers of frozen pizza fame, BMW, Porsche, uh, Mercedes-Benz, Volkswagen, and then as well some American companies, Krispy Kreme, Dewey Egberts, I think that's a Dutch company, uh, Dr. Yeah. Pepper, and then uh, something that broke my heart, Preta Manger, because I've, yeah. I've committed so much to their bottom line over the years. So, um, <laughs> Who hasn't? <laughs> of the, you know, these are... It, could it really be the case that all of these businesses are deeply connected with Nazi wealth? Well, it's not so much the businesses themselves. Well, for a lot of them, there are. But I wouldn't say pret a manger which was founded by a Jewish Londoner, uh, has <laughs> any ties. You know? It's about, uh, in generally, it's the families that, own, that owned them in the past or that currently own them or control them. That have the ties with 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 uh, with the third Reich, with the exploitation, with profiteering of the third Reich. So yeah, well maybe let's talk about a particular character from the book, uh, Friedrich Flick. I thought was a particularly egregious character. Right. Tell us about this fella. Yeah, I mean he's probably the most powerful German industrialist of the twentieth century, a man who was. Germany's wealthiest individual in 1930, 1945, and 1960, and in, and at the death, and at the time of his death in, in 1972, was you know one of the world's richest men, uh, top five richest men. So he, you know, he kind of personifies in a way the opportunism because they were there is a profit of the third right were for a large part, you know, sheer opportunists. There were. There were there were some ideologues, but most of them they just wanted to expand their businesses, their business fortunes, and their business empires. Um, and they, you know, he ran Germany's largest steel, coal, and weapons conglomerate during the Third Reich, and is the only one of my main characters who actually got sentenced after World War Two uh, at in a Nuremberg in one of the Nuremberg uh, trials in one of the trials at Nuremberg for war crimes and crimes against humanity. And he was sentenced to seven and a half years in prison, in Landsberg prison, uh, outside of Munich. And his, his, his sentence was commuted in 1950. And he was allowed to keep all of his assets, or at least in, in, in West Germany. And when he came out, you know, five, within five years, he was back on top as Germany's richest man, as the controlling shareholder of Daimler-Benz and, you know, uh, yeah, he was able to 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 build out his conglomerate, yeah, easily. There's a recurring theme of these characters, um, how they would just weasel their way into the Nazi Party and almost feign the ideology the entire way. They were sort right. of like the archetypal, yeah. archetypical, archetypal, cynical capitalist. And you yeah. wrote about them, yeah calculating unscrupulous opportunists looking to expand their business empires at any cost yeah yeah i mean 
uh, these men, you know, and there were there were men. Uh, um, they, yeah, they, they 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 weren't necessarily fans of of Hitler and the Nazi Party. You know, they weren't. They were kind of establishment conservative. They they backed establishment conservative candidates or whoever they considered to be best for the for their bottom lines and whoever economic policies were best. But what Hitler promised them and what he initially also delivered on was that, of course, you know, Hitler seized power in January 1933 off the back of, you know, coming off the, you know, it was the tail end of the Great Depression. And, you know, these men had lost part of their fortunes. I mean, there were millions of Germans were unemployed, you know, um, and had lost, you know, they wanted to save their businesses and their fortunes, no matter what. And, and you know, Hitler initiated the largest rearmament program um, the world had ever seen at that point. And, and, and you know, you had billions, well, uh, initially, hundreds of millions of Reichsmarks and soon billions of Reichsmarks flowing back into the coffers of these industrialists you know, who would start producing weapons, which is forbidden under under the Treaty of Versailles, but, you know, to, to rearm Nazi Germany or to rearm Germany um, as Hitler already started, you know, ramping up to wars as early as, you know, early 1934. I mean, the, yeah. The, the goal was was pretty clear what what Hitler already did his aim yeah was pretty clear it was it was expansion and occupation so they and that was of course yeah I mean to these men you know that was that was that was that was that was great you know they 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 could they, they could revive their industrial industrial companies whether it was steel coal or or weapons manufacturing companies or batteries or accumulators or whatever they, they did to feed feed the German war machine, which of course continued on into World War II. Could you give an example of a character who really embodies this idea where they themselves at their core were maybe apolitical? You know, they weren't Nazis. They maybe even didn't hold anti-Jewish sentiments. Yet, nonetheless, they pretended and put that skin on just to get the benefits of the um, of the Nazi party. Yeah, I think, you know, the two main characters in my book, I mean, who personified it's Günter Quant and Friedrich Flick kind of embody, embody that, that opportunistic sentiment, you know, where these were not, you know, they had Jewish board members who they, of course, summarily fired. After the seizure of power, you know, they went along, but they were thrived in any political system, right? Whether it was the German Empire, um, the Weimar Republic, uh, Nazi Germany, occupied West Germany, West Germany, reunified Germany. I mean, mm. that, uh, I would argue they would even come on top in a communist system, you know. Mm. Um, they, yeah. I, I think that's that's a personification is to be able to thrive, to financially thrive in any political system, regardless of whether it's democratic, autocratic, whatever. Bradley Hope called the book uh, the anti Schindler's List. So, could you talk uh, a little bit about how these industrialists took advantage of um, the slave labor, the Jews in the concentration camps? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, in addition to mass rearmament, there were two other fields where, where, um, these men profit massively profited from persecution. And one was of course the expropriation of, of Jewish owned companies and, uh, you know, family, Jewish owned companies and, and, and Jewish families, the assets of Jewish families or business families. And of course, the expropriation in German occupied territories during World War II, um, as well as the mass exploitation of forced and slave labor uh, during World War II, which was, you know, an estimate between 12 and 20 million uh, Europeans were deported to, 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 to Germany and forced to work in German factories and mines. 
uh, you know, and Friedrich Flick had an estimated uh, 100,000 forced and slave laborers working for, or, or, uh, that he exploited, and Gunter Quant had uh, almost 60,000. Is a, is a low, is a conservative estimate. Hmm. I mean, that's an incredible amount of people. It's a giant labor force. It is. I mean, Hitler he, he initiated the largest coerced labor program uh, to date uh, after he invaded in June 1941, after he invaded um, or after his army invaded the Soviet Union. Because all able-bodied men were were at the front. They were, yeah, they were they were at the East Front. They were fighting. They were um, fighting the Soviet Union, and they, he he needed to keep keep to keep feeding a Nazi war machine. And you know, forced labor and slave labor were were the ways for him to to do to accomplish that goal. And so, what were these um, prisoners? doing like specifically what were they making how were they contributing I'm, i mean they were making everything from you know they were everything from from they were working in mines they were manufacturing weapons they were uh manufacturing tanks uh car, you know automobiles you know trucks jeeps you name it i mean it was anything that 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 yeah, and under but under the most horrific circumstances, right? Yeah. Where they would be abused at random, exploited at random. Uh, you know, no medical care. You know, no protective, um, no protective gear that they were wearing to protect them against acids or you know, um, uh, yeah, mal malnourished. You know, mal malnutrition. Uh, 40 people sleeping in one room, you know, it was the circumstances of, of these 12 to 20 million, of which 2.5 million estimate also died as forced enslaved laborers, you know, it was, was, was horrific. Is there any way to um, do the accounting of just how much they exploited the slave labor? You've got numbers of how many they were, but maybe in how much economic value they created, um, you know, That's, I know it's almost impossible to know, but maybe if someone's attempted it, not not to my knowledge, because I would certainly use that number mm. uh, in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, no, that's an impossible. And I think, given the perverse nature of the of the labor, I think no, you know, it's it's like, yeah. It's it, it's I don't, as far as I know, no one's ever attempted to to kind of quantify you know how much trillions of output because these people were also, you know, already when they arrived, whether they were you know Soviet forced uh, prisoners of war or concentration camp captives or forced laborers from the east or wherever or from the west, you know, uh, they were already often you know they were f forced, they were exploited, they were often malnourished or were wounded, you know, they were abused. So it's, it's there were you, you didn't have people working at full capacity, you know, mm -hmm. so it's also, I'm not sure if you, even if you try to quantify that you give it, did you give an accurate reflection of, of how, you know, quote unquote useful these people were. So the heirs of these Nazi billionaires have grown richer since. Could you say of the five families, you know, what the, uh, that you could find out what their particular size stakes are in the different brands that we mentioned earlier Whew. okay so yeah so the, the bmw quants had owned 47 about 47 percent of the bmw group that's huge yeah it's huge yeah that stake represents i think 50 billion just in the market value of, of, of BMW's market value. Yeah. Um, yeah. Somewhere around that. I haven't checked the BMW stock price in a while. But, and, but yeah. And that's, and that's private money. That's private wealth. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's unbelievable. Well, I mean, it's right. It's not, I mean, this is not lick. I mean, it throws off a whole lot of cash, right? Because mm. they get, you know, this year they got a 
over last year they got a billion billion euros in dividends between the two of them other years it's 800 million <laughs> but um but yeah but but yeah so but of course the stake itself you know it's yeah, it's 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 not a lick. I mean, you can sell it down, but if your controlling shareholder starts selling down, then you know that, that doesn't keep a lot of um, confidence confidence in, in, in yeah in, in a company. So, so 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 much of that stake is is not. I mean, it's liquid, but it's not. You know, um, uh, yeah, it's not that liquid, um, and. I mean the, you know, some of the families in in the book that I write, some of them they 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 don't uh, they don't control an operative company anymore. They just invest their billions in through their family offices in art or real estate or private equity or hedge funds or you name it, like like the Flick sort of on things, which is it's a family that co-founded Allianz in Munich Re. But then the, I mean, the Porsches, they just spun off. Um, they just spun off Porsche from the Volkswagen group, right? And the Volkswagen group doesn't only control Porsche and Volkswagen, but also Audi, Lamborghini, Bentley, Skoda, Seat. Um, so it's the largest car manufacturer in the world, I think, together with a Chinese uh, car company. And they own, I mean, they own a majority of of Porsche still, now that it's separately listed. Uh, um, and also of, of the Volkswagen Group um, through all these, you know, it's it's a pretty intricate model, but, it, but it's, you know, they have a majority in, in voting rights in, in, in both, both companies or both conglomerates. Mm. And the Utkers, they had a split, so... Um, there was a there was a big conflict between the eight siblings, uh, the current heirs, and and the, the con con conglomerate has been divided into two separate uh, conglomerates, and five own Doctor Utker, and the other and the, the remaining three own the Utker sibling, Utker siblings conglomerate, which has certain assets, but that that's a hundred percent ownership because it's a private company. A lot of the commentary I've seen around the book revolves around the sheer amount of work and research you had to do. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a, I mean, I moved from I moved from from New York to to Berlin in October 2017, and you know, it was this writing and researching a book was my focus for you know four years. You know, my main focus for four years. I mean, I was freelancing on the side, but. But yeah, the book was, was, you know, it was every day. It was just yeah, full on. All right. And what does that yeah. involve? Well, it involves going to a lot of archives in in Germany and Europe and also North America. Uh, it involves, you know, a lot of free writing. <laughs> it involves just trying to synthesize enormous amount of information and, and seeing you know what's relevant what's not i mean the final book you know it has i think 325 pages or so like text you know i think it's 400 or one all with like 50 percent and uh, 50 pages and notes and you you name it but the book is 325 and and i, I cut out 100 pages which were like not even that they were it's you know on the advice of my editor which were just also not in hindsight like it wasn't really necessary they were yeah it's good that they were cut out you know mm. but yeah yeah just a lot of things that were just rep re repetitive or didn't really add to the narrative because that's you know yeah yeah because you need to you need to contact the, the reader's attention for um, you know, uh, for granted, you know, you kind of keep, keep them, have to keep them engaged in this narrative propulsion. Yeah. Well, the, the book is, um, written like a narrative. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's stories. Um, so it's very, very easy yeah. to consume, yeah. uh, from that perspective, but, uh, give us an example, right? So you discover this quant website, you know, one pager built in the nineties, no one's touched it since how do you then unravel that thread 
you know, actually, what are you doing? Yeah, I mean, of course, the book is based on articles that I wrote for Bloomberg, right? So when I saw that website, I mean, it was the basis for an article I ended up writing for Bloomberg and it was published in 2013. I mean, I went to the family of, I interviewed, I, I got an, I had an appointment and went with a colleague of mine from the Frankfurt Bureau, interviewed the CEO at the time. Um, uh, yeah, at the family office outside of Frankfurt and, and you know, made an average also of, 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 of like annualized, of, of like calculated annualized returns and, and stuff. But that was more for the Bloomberg angle. But for, for the book, you know, it was mainly going to the Quant Archive, Family Archive, which was in Darmstadt, which is also south of Frankfurt. Mm. And, um, and yeah, doing, doing the research there. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, they spending a week in Darmstadt doing archival research. And archival research is you're just trawling through hundreds, thousands of pages of, uh, business documents, personal, you know, correspondence. Yeah. Oh, exactly. A mix of that. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And then you're B- taking yeah, notes on the side. Personal correspondence, business. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I see what's relevant for my, but you know, and then see what's relevant, what's not relevant, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you go back home, compile that in a big document, have several different documents to the different families, and then try to create a narrative between all of it. Yeah. yeah. It, it's uh, for me, yeah. I'm projecting onto it, but it's an incredibly like, uh, you know, romantic idea of, of work. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. incredible. It's know? not that romantic. It's just work. You know, it's just work. <laughs> It's just work. It's just, it's just, uh, it's just uh, a struggle. It's, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's not, uh, yeah, it's just work. And yeah. nothing um, romantic about it. <laughs> the, how was the German, um, how, how has Germany reacted to your publication? Has it been published in German yet? And, do people interview you over there? Is there any interest in your book coming out of Germany? Very much. I mean, the the, the original language version, the English version of the book was published in late April or April 19, 2022. Uh, and the German version came out two weeks later. And it's an incredible translation, incredibly well done. Um they put, you know, the German publisher put enormous amount of efforts into it. And, uh, and, you know, put two translators on it, an external editor. And it's been incredibly well received. It was number one on the uh, the side, uh, uh, best, you know, bestsellers list, Um, you know, very good reviews, very good sales, you know, I think it's it's fourth, 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 fifth printing now, you know, and I love giving talks in Germany because the, the, the questions are really good and they're always very nuanced and also critical and they know the, the topic really well. And it's, mm. yeah, I really, I think, yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's, a, it's about Germany. I mean, it's about the world, but it's about Germany, the book. Yeah. In this. And what about the response from the families involved? How have you managed communication with them? Well, I list all the response at the end of the book in, in the appendix, you know, um, you know, approach them either through their family offices or their spokespeople or directly, and, and and you know they all rejected my interview requests except for one uh, grandson of of Friedrich Flick, who I had his private email uh, or I'd like corresponded with him over email. Mm. Yeah, but the nature had, um, of it, and you know, he was quite candid and and reflective, you know. But, mm. Even he said, you know, bad things have come out of my grandfather, but to us, to me, he's a genius who gave us so much more than wealth alone. So, what did he give him? Uh, well, I, I guess, it, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess, um, uh, and I, I guess a role model. I guess, I guess an example. I guess, right. and then that you know goes to show. I mean. The end of the book is, is this kind of whitewashing of history that 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 the families that control BMW and 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 Porsche engage in, right? Where they 
where they, you know, maintain massive global uh, charitable foundations or media prizes or museums in the name of their fa fathers and grandfathers and celebrate them for the business success, but leave out their war crimes. And that's the reason that I wanted to write a book was, was kind of shine a light on that. Um, uh, sh shine a light on that, you know, the whitewashing of history that's still happening today. Mm. And, um, and, and also how the difficulties they find it to, to kind of, you know, separate themselves from, you know, kind of, yeah, uh, kind of cri critical separation from their, from their fathers and grandfathers in that sense. And so what should be done about your discoveries? I mean, I think people should make up their own minds what they want to do with the facts that I lay out in the book. But I think, you know, as consumers, one should be aware that if you spent, you know, money or whatever products these families own, um, you know, um, that your money can end up being having dividends of, of, of um, can end up as the dividends for these families and can, can go towards maintaining, you know, um, massive charitable foundations, uh, museums, academic chairs, mm -hmm. corporate headquarters in the name of, of Nazi war criminals without any kind of transparency of who these men actually were. Right. 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 Um, um, aside from their business successes, you know, but not the fact that they rent concentration camps or that they, or that they built concentration camps or that they exploited tens of thousands of forced slave laborers or that they were the largest weapons producers of, of, of the third Reich. It's, it's, you know, it's to, for one to be cognizant of history, you know, and mm. to kind of take moral responsibility for history as well. I mean, my book is an argument in favor of historical transparency. Is it also, um, in favor of reparations? Well, I mean, the reparation question has already kind of been concluded. So, so that's that's that. Those 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 are long. Those are generally long gone debates or mm -hmm. long concluded debates. You know, there's still restitution going on with regards to art and particularly with art and, and real estate. But, mm -hmm. but you know, the compensation with regards to forced slave labor, the compensation question was was concluded in the late 1990s, and of course, it's been many many kind of restitution uh, agreements that have been made between post-1945 and, and even still today with regards to the return of assets that were robbed mm. uh, or, or bought far under market value by, by you know, Germans or other institutions. David, is there anything left on the table in terms of Nazi billionaires, something you felt like um, I should have brought up, but I didn't? Yeah, I think it's important to realize, like, why did I cho chose these five families, for example, is that, you know, I wanted to focus on families that are still relevant mm -hmm. uh, in German, if in, in, in not only in German and European business, but in global business. And that are, you know, that have accumulated that, that, you know, not for instance, like the family Krupp or Thyssen, who are not, you know, there's no families they, they, there's no family anymore. There's no dynasty anymore. They don't play any significant role in global business. Um, you know, and, and, and those that had profited the most. So they still have to be relevant today mm -hmm. and uh, in business um, and or finance. Um, and, um, you know, and they had to also be uh, had to profit it, you know, not only through massive weapons production, but also through uh, expropriation of Jewish owned assets and assets in, in German occupied Europe and, and the mass exploitation of forced and slave labor. Is it worthwhile saying a quick word just to wrap up the book on uh, Magda Friedlander? I mean, plenty to say about about her. You know, it's a little bit of an of an offside in the book in a, in a way, but it's 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 yeah. I mean, Magda Friedland or Magda Richo, she was born. But she was born. Um, you know, was married for ten years to Günter Quant, the patriarch of the Quant dynasty, and one one son came out of that marriage, Harald Quant, but she of course became later known as as Magda Goebbels. You know the. The first lady of the Third Reich. Mm. 
mm. who, who ended up, you know, who was married to Josef Goebbels, the Nazi minister of propaganda, and, and who ended up murdering her six children uh, in the in the fur bunker on April 30th, 1945. Mm. And she, I mean, yeah, I mean, bizarre character, fascinating character. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, Somebody who, you know, her boy, childhood boyfriend was Chaim Arlozorov, who became this very Zionist, famous Zionist. He was a Jewish guy. Her stepfather was Jewish. That's where she got the name Friedlander from. Friedlander from. Mm. Then she married Günter Quandt, who, of course, one of the most powerful industrialists in Germany. And then she ended up, uh, you know, rising to infamy as, as, as Josef Goebbels' wife. So certainly a, a multifaceted character. And yeah, the mother of Harald Quant, who of course represents one of the branches of the Quant, Quant family, mm -hmm. and the only one to survive as, as a heir of, of, of Magda Goebbels or Magda Quant. Why, in the first place, did you decide to write this book and devote so much time and effort uh, to compiling this document? I think you know. I think what struck me was when I was reporting in Germany, you know, for Bloomberg. Um, it's uh, the stories I always come back with were this mix of the financial business and the you know fi financial historical and, and and business aspects of things, and the you know what struck me was that companies like BMW and Porsche, but particularly the families that control them, you know, celebrate their business their 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 patriarchs, their fathers, their grandfathers for their business successes, but leave out their war crimes and. I think that's really why I decided to write a book was to shine a light on this whitewashing of history. And, you know, that's also, the book is also an argument in favor of historical transparency. Mm. Is that you can't, you know, if you only show the good of history, it, it doesn't really show anything. It's just a whitewash for in, in order, especially in the time uh, of, of misinformation, of such misinformation and fake news, etc. That, you know, for these families of incredible... Uh, economic, um, you know, responsibility, economic, financial, and, and therefore also political, also, uh, you know, political responsibilities in that sense, you know, kind of icons of, of German industry, uh, or icons of, of, of Germany, um, that they are transparent about history, that they, that they take up their moral responsibility and that's something, you know, German business as a whole has never really taken moral responsibility for the crimes of the Third Reich. And these families are continuing kind of negating that as well, negating that history. As a historian, how often are you confronted with whitewashing, not just in Germany, but in other areas you cover? Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I would say as a financial journalist rather than a historian, but both, I guess. So often, you know, I mean, of course, companies always try to paint a rosier picture of, of, of their past and or or their or their current and then 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 is actually the case. How does that influence the way you look at anything older than like two hundred years? I mean, how much can we really know? How much of that has been whitewashed and the actual events are just lost? <laughs> Oh wow! Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I concern myself with with contemporary events and contemporary history, so I try not to look past. I would say uh, World War One. You know, I would say World War One or like the past hundred and fifty years. I don't know. I mean, yeah. it's yeah, it's yeah, can't yeah. Um, but you know, I would say that the Netherlands. You know, if you look at kind of their slavery past or the colonial mm. past, you know. It's, a collaboration past, you know, has so much to reckon with in, in terms of uh, in terms of their history. Do you know um, the 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 Tropenheim Museum? Is it called Tropenheim or Troop? Yeah, Trope Museum. Yeah, the Trope Museum. Trope Museum. Yeah. So I remember going there when I lived in Amsterdam with my missus, and on the point you just made, it is supposed to be a museum dedicated to sort of the Black history of the Netherlands. Uh, or at least the yeah. exhibition we saw well, at the time was Well, not the black that. history of the Netherlands, but it's like the colo yeah, kind yeah. of colonial history and of the Netherlands, it, in itself. Right? And it did a very, very poor job of pointing out how yeah. integral the Dutch were in the slave trade 
and yeah, the yeah, history exactly. of the exactly. East India Company. Like, yeah. uh, and so you talk about whitewashing, you know, um, I just it, it's something that has stayed with me a little bit, how this museum, which yeah. was supposed to be dedicated to this, in fact, uh, did a really good job at showing, you know, how good the Dutch were in some areas. Oh, they were bad in these areas, but overall, look yeah, what they've given uh, to them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. That that's still, I would say, the prevailing Dutch sentiment. Like, yeah, I would, yeah, definitely. But if you're looking at documents that are 100, 150 years old, and you can barely, you know, figure out what the well, you can figure it out, but you can notice all the attempts at whitewashing in between. It must. P- well, no, I, cross- I look at the current events of whitewashing, right? Like where you have in Germany the BMW Foundation Herbert Quant, you know, which has the quote inspire responsible leadership, you know, after a man who, you know, built sub concentration camp in German occupied Poland, who, mm. who you know, exploited uh, thousands of forced slave laborers, men, women, um, from concentration camps and battery factories in Berlin, and who bought companies stolen from Jews in France. I mean, and then you have, you know, you have a massive charitable foundation, his name called, it's with the, the motto, Inspire Responsible Leadership. I mean, mm. that is really the, the, you know, just grotesque, you know, mm-hmm. and it's perversity and, and, and it's with blade and whitewashing, you know, and yeah. And then you have, you know, similarly, and he's the father of, of the two BMW heirs. So, yeah, I mean, that that's the kind of, that's the kind of, examples yeah that 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 led me to write this book this kind of this really blatant and brazen whitewashing of of history and so would you have them just acknowledge their history you know rename these awards rename these charitable foundations just well no i mean I mean, it's very difficult to do it with private companies or institutions, right? So I think you should give them this. These are not municipalities or or, or, or cities or whatever where you you know where where you can have voters or whatever where you can. These are yeah, these are private companies or private entities. So I think you should give them the option rather than immediately renaming. You should give them the option. If either you're fully transparent, radically transparent, you show their business successes and their war crimes. If mm-hmm. you don't want to do that, you should rename them. Mm-hmm. Well, look, um, we- talk a little bit about Israel. So you live there now. Um, what about your work in Israel and Lebanon? What are you doing now? Well, I work as a Middle East correspondent for the for the Dutch Financial Daily, which is a daily daily financial newspaper. And uh, and yeah, I mean, there's a lot going on in, in in well, there's always a lot going on in the Middle East, but particularly there's a lot going on in Israel at the moment. So mm. it's really it's quite busy. Yeah. Why'd you move from Bloomberg? Well, I left Bloomberg to 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 do the to to write the book. So so and that took me four years, four and a half years. So then uh, we moved because my my fiance she's. Um, She's a TV correspondent. She's German, and she's a TV correspondent for um, for Israel and Palestine, and and she, uh, yeah, she studied Hebrew and and, and Arabic, and um, yeah, so so that's why we moved, and then yeah, I got this 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 you know, gig as a Middle East correspondent. And I think it's great. So you, know? you you moved for the family, and then had to find a job that fit the move. Yeah, basically, yeah. essentially, yeah. yeah. And um, with the Dutch Financial Daily, are you doing the same type of investigative journalism into family offices, private wealth uh, in the Middle East? No, not as of yet. No, 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 no not yet. No, no, it's more geopolitical. Mm. It's more focused on business finance and geopolitics, but uh, yeah. Why did Nicholas ask me to ask you specifically about Lebanon? Um, yeah, I mean, well, cause we both, <laughs> we, we've, we've both spent time there. Uh, and I mean, I went there because, uh, Sophie, my, my fiance, she went there for a month, uh, to, um, to learn, to, to brush up her Arabic. And I think it's a, 
you know, I think it's a fascinating country. It's also, and I was back there in late 2021 um, as, uh, you know, to report on the economic crisis there. And I think it's, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's a tragedy what's happening with the country, you know, there where it's just, yeah, um, it's kind of being, being plundered from the, from the, from the top. Uh, and, and yeah, I just think Beirut is, is, is a great place. It's just a wonderful mm. city to spend time in and, and, and the surrounding areas as well. And, you know, you want to spend time in the mountains and in, in Fakha or Farija or in the, um, or on the sea in Batroun, you know, it's, it's just a wonderful, it's a very hospitable place, you know. So your missus speaks German, English, Arabic, and Hebrew. And French. My goodness. That's a crazy yeah. polygot. I uh, know. She, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it must yeah, be fun traveling with her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't have to say a word. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And All right. I, um, yeah. Minia de Jong, three questions I try to ask as many yeah. uh, guests as possible. The first, the role of serendipity in your life. Oh, yeah. Massive. Massive. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So many serendipitous events have led me to jobs or to otherwise to, yeah. Serendipity is incredibly important. You know, I mean, Co coincidence, uh, uh, serendipity, yeah, it's, definitely uh, uh, one that plays a, play a massive role in my life. Who, I mean, the re reason I, I got introduced at Bloomberg was because I once, you know, I was having coffee. Uh, it was just twenty to early twenty ten. I was having coffee with my with my uh, with a friend. Um, and uh, this guy was reading a book and we got into a conversation and, you know, we became friends and then he was working at a other, this is in New York, another newspaper. Then he went to Bloomberg. And then when I was looking for jobs, he introduced me there, you know, and it wow. was like a random co coffee event. So I think, yeah, that, that's definitely serendipitous. Yeah. A hundred percent. And, um, you know, we can't there's no there's no counterfactual there's no what if but had you not known someone at bloomberg who's to say you would have worked at bloomberg who's to say you would have then had exactly the exactly education to exactly. write nazi billionaires and you know exactly so exactly see it's exactly. incredible yeah incredible. totally all right yeah. um a country you're particularly bullish on oh wow <laughs> i'm bullish on german oh no uh, let's let's that's a good let me let me give a give a sec to think about that one i am bullish in germany i'm always bullish in germany <laughs> i think germany i think i think let's let's yeah yeah i mean it's it's a country that's you know in its core it's still very deeply conservative and also in many ways provincial and 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 quite rigid but i think you know i think it has it's a country with so much potential even so much untapped potential mm. you know if they if they would let go of this kind of this rigidity that they're that they're stuck in i think you know that so i'm bullish because i think it has so much up it has so much upwards potential it has so much upside still yeah something yeah. i find really interesting about germany from my limited experience in Europe yeah, sure. is that they are so insular. Like all their media mm -hmm. is German. Mm -hmm. All of their TV is yeah. German. They, yeah. they, they do yeah. not it's engage they dub. with the European community. It's, 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 it's because they don't dub. This is my advice. So it's because they dub, you know, they, it's in German, like, because their language, I mean, if you, you know, and they're very self-conscious of that, but Germans and English, it's so bad, you know, <laughs> And I grew up with nothing being dubbed, you know. Mm. Um, you have subtitles. I mean, it's just yeah. I think it's it's a crime, really, if you dub. But apparently, the dubbing the dubbing lobby in Germany is just no joke. It's quite strong. <laughs> the dubbing lobby. Yeah. Who's yeah. who's the chief of dubbing? 
But yeah, that's a good question. That's my new <laughs> investigative story. <laughs> yeah, but 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 look, you know, but as a counter example, not only in the Netherlands, but if you go to Portugal, for example, Portugal, everybody speaks like impeccable English. Like a lot of people speak impeccable English, and I always ask them why, because it's like so striking, especially if you come from Germany. Mm. And they're like, yeah, because we look at you know. Um, our television programs or Netflix, nothing is dubbed, you know, we get a really good, you know, it's like a really good way to learn English. Yeah. Um, what so, is, yeah. what so, is the untapped potential in Germany? <laughs> if you remove the control of the dubbing lobby, then, <laughs> you know. No, I mean, I think it's still, it can be, it can be more international. It can be so much more international. It can be less hierarchical. It can be more modern. It can be more contemporary. It's so stuck always. It's always a couple decades behind. You yeah. know, I feel the Germans. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's the eight. I don't know where they are. You know, whether it's like I feel like they got stuck somewhere in the. I don't know. 50s, 60s, 70s. I don't know. It's it, it's it's hard to gauge. But but it's like, the, yeah. Uh, well, it's it's something that the Dutch have and that the Germans don't. It's like innovation. They lack innovation. They can do so much more in terms of innovation of their products, of their businesses. You know, it's a certain kind of flexibility. You know, you know um, where where you know if they're yeah. I mean, it's it's they're still you know the backbone of the economy is still the car industry. Mm. You know, innovation came really late there. On, yeah, so. Yeah, I would say it's uh, it's really, really funny you say that because I've sold uh, two products to the European market. One was a booking system, and one was a CRM. And anecdotally, Germany is such a bad market to call one because the language, yeah, thing, yeah. like even executives at these companies, yeah. a lot of the yeah. time will, yeah, they won't speak yeah. English, and then. Um, they are using software like SAP or they're using this software that was installed when they first went online in the 90s and they never updated and they will never change. And um, even my German colleagues, you know, they have this perennial problem of the German won't pick up a, a cold call. They need to be introduced. It's a very no. old fashioned. You yes, must have true. a handshake. You must be in yes, a boardroom totally with true. them. And it's, it's quite funny that you say that Basically. because anecdotally, it does make them so much more rigid and old fashioned is what we would say. Yeah. But then on the other side of things, and this complements what you said at the very, very beginning of the conversation, once you're in, you're in. And that's uh, quite right. comforting and actually a great yeah. way to build relationships. All right, Mr. De Jong, final question. If you could listen to a podcast between any two people of history, dead or alive, no language barrier, who are you listening to? Wow. Wow. <laughs> I would I would definitely listen to a conversation between between uh Stalin and Hitler. I mean that would be if they <laughs> You know, well, no, Hitler seemed like a terrible. I mean, they're both actually awful. Court. Yeah. No, no, you didn't want two more. No, 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 no. scrap that. Yeah, you'd Let's rather their chief of positive. communications each talk to exactly, each other. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, no, I mean, you want to have two really good speakers. You want to have two like really good, like orators. So it would be like, I don't know, who's like famous, like kind of a you know like a, a jfk and um yeah. a jfk and um a jfk and obama or something you know like two yeah i will be or jfk and mandela or something you know mm -hmm. like inspiring people like live well i, I mean jfk was was yeah um but yeah, something like that, you know, like just inspiring, like, yeah, not, not to, not to arch villains, not to, not to genocidal dictators. You want, you want to inspire, you want, like, you, you want to take a thing away of a kind of, the, mm. the, yeah, the, the great things of history. So, yeah, something like that, JFK and Mandela, JFK and Obama. I mean, Obama and Mandela met, so. People who hadn't, who haven't, who, who didn't, who never got a chance to meet each other. Uh. All right. Well, 
David, um, thank you for being so generous with your time. Thank you for the book. My pleasure. Uh, I loved it. It was right up my alley. Really, really interesting to read about. And um, thank you. I look forward in keeping tabs on everything you discover in the world of offshore finance and financial secrecy and all this chicanery. Thank you, Ryan. It was a pleasure. Thanks for the time.